Good afternoon, I'm Troy Smythe. I'm manager of interpretive strategy for the Corning Museum of Glass. Uh, for those unfamiliar with the term interpretive strategy, the way I explain my role is in relationship to the curators with whom I work. Uh, our curators are content specialists and I'm a content strategist. I work with our curators and many others on behalf of museum visitors to create exhibitions in which guests can most successfully make meaning from and find a sense of belonging in the stories that the museum shares about its collection. Um, as we were just hearing from uh, Salvador, one powerful way museums magnify the relevance of object stories to visitors is by considering the unique expertise that's represented by community members beyond the museum's walls. Uh, the exhibition inspiring this year's seminar, Past, Present, Expanding the Stories of Glass, involved the expertise of many community members, some of whom are presenting here today and have been referred to in other talks. But what are the keys to successfully gathering collective wisdom so that exhibitions resonate with more people? And how do museums recognize these community contributions and build authentic relationships in the process? Um, so we heard kind of an overview from Salvador, kind of how that happens. What uh, this session is gonna do is actually introduce you um, to a couple of people who have some case studies to share with us. Uh, and then we're going to uh, kind of engage in uh, kind of just a moderated discussion that digs a little deeper into some of the issues surrounding uh, community-based uh, programming in exhibitions. So I'd like to introduce you to our two panelists for today. Um, Melanie Parker is a curator with Illich Holdings Incorporated, where she develops exhibits that share the history of companies owned by the Illich family, including Little Caesars Pizza, the Detroit Tigers baseball team, the Detroit Red Wings hockey team, and the historic Fox Theater. Uh, prior, the, she most recently worked as an interpretive planner at the Detroit Institute of Arts, where she collaborated with curators to create exhibitions on a range of topics that are relevant, accessible, and personally meaningful for visitors. Uh, Melanie is on the board of the Michigan Museums Association and volunteers with the Association of Art Museum Interpretation. She earned her MS in Historic Preservation from Eastern Michigan University and a BA in History and American Studies from the University of Michigan Dearborn. Uh, Dr. Samir Magelli is the senior curator at the Smithsonian's Anacostia Community Museum in Washington, D.C. He received his B.A. from the University of Pennsylvania and his M.A. and uh, Master's of Philosophies and Ph.D. in History from Columbia University. His research, teaching, and curatorial work have focused on social movements, urban history, and cultural history. Dr. Magelli has authored, co-authored, and co-edited several works, and his writings have appeared in the New York Times, Philadelphia Tribune, and Washington Informer. His most recent exhibitions include A Right to the City, 2018 through 2020, uh, which explored the history and contemporary dynamics of neighborhood change and community activism in Washington, D.C., and an outdoor and indoor exhibition entitled Food for the People, Eating and Activism in Greater Washington, which received the 2021 Smithsonian Excellence and Exhibitions Award. Um, so welcome to both of you. Uh, and I think we'll start with you, Melanie. Uh, if you could, uh, if y'all could queue up Melanie's um, PowerPoint presentation. And uh, Melanie, just so you know, to get to the next slide, you just say next slide. Thank you. I think I'm going to be able to share. I did submit my PowerPoint, but I think I'm going to be able okay. to share it here so I can see my um, speakers' notes. Is everyone seeing? I think it's starting to. There it goes. Yeah. yeah I don't see that. Okay, fantastic. Um, thank you very much, Troy, for the introduction. Um, uh, and so, uh, again, my name is, is Melanie Parker. Um, my pronouns are she and her. And today I'm going to talk about facilitating uh, community created exhibit labels. Um, and so to underscore um, the introduction that Troy gave, um, I'm currently working as a curator with a corporate collection at Illich Holdings in Detroit, Michigan, but I spent seven years um, prior to this um, at, in the interpretation department at the Detroit Institute of Arts or the DIA. Um, and there I, I worked, uh, my position was very similar to Troy. So as he described his role, um, that, that is what I did at the DIA. Um, and so what I'm going to focus on today is derived from my work there. Um, and I'm going to focus on the process of developing community authored labels in the DIA's 2017 exhibition, Art of Rebellion, Black Art of the Civil Rights Movement, curated by Valerie Mercer. 
And sort of as a as a side note, um, this uh, the the focus. Um, this is the focus of a my portion of an upcoming article in the journal exhibition um, called "Toward Shared Authority" that I co-authored um, with Allison Kreitz at the Southern Vermont Art Center and Amelia Wiggins at the Delaware Art Museum. And that process of writing that article really helped to sharpen and solidify um, my thoughts and my reflections on this project because it has been sort of five years since we since we did this exhibition. Um, and so that's coming out soon. And the whole focus of that is on community authored content um, at the three respective institutions. So in the Art of Rebellion, um, there were six community authored labels, one of which appears um, in the photo to the right of the screen. And these were written by members of a community advisory panel that was formed to help shape the exhibition. The labels were written in the first person under the heading, A Detroiter Responds. And the writer was identified by their name and their chosen professional title. And the labels provided their personal insights on the work of art itself um, and or on the social and historical context that the artwork evokes. So for example, the label shown here appeared next to a photograph of Malcolm X by Adger Cowens, and the community contributor discussed Malcolm X as a person, his work, and the impact that he had on her personally. In some cases, these labels appeared alongside a museum written text with more um, typical art historical content. In other cases, the community contributed label stood alone. In one instance, uh, the community label actually replaced a museum written text that we had already drafted because the author offered a more compelling insight than what we had written. And in another, we actually cut a community contributor label before printing because the author requested us to do so. So this was on the whole a very flexible process. So how did we get to these labels? Um, Art of Rebellion showcased 34 paintings, sculptures, and photographs by African-American artists who formed collectives nationwide during the civil rights movement to make art for African-American audiences that asserted Black identity and rights to racial justice. The exhibition also included some works by artists who, working into the present, um, who, though not part of collectives, use art making as a catalyst for social change. And within this nationwide look, um, we also examined the local history of the Detroit Rebellion of 1967, commonly referred to as a riot, which was one of the worst instances of civil unrest in U.S. history and uh, was a response to pervasive racism in housing and employment in the city and to police brutality. And so Art of Rebellion, this exhibition was among the DIA's contributions to a community-wide observance of the 50th anniversary of this event, where over a hundred cultural organizations in the city proper and in the metro area um, were convened with exhibits and programming um, spearheaded by the Detroit Historical Museum. So they were the initiators of this convening. And sort of under this um, overarching umbrella, the DIA partnered especially closely with the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History, particularly through the community engagement. And their own art exhibition called Say It Loud featured um, overlapping themes and artists yet with distinct execution. So just this map on the right just kind of gives you a snapshot of the proximity of the three museums that I've mentioned by name, the Wright the Historical Museum and the DIA which are all located within kind of a couple block radius of one another. So you can sort of imagine how in the summer of 2017, the exhibits and the programming that these three orgs among so many others were doing were kind of permeating um, this area, which is commonly referred to as the Detroit um, sort of cultural district. So because this event in Detroit's history is still fresh in the minds and lived experiences of many Detroiters, and because the um, issues that the exhibitions raise reverberate into the present, the most responsible way to approach this work was with community members. We um, anticipated that the conversations we would have with them would be deeper and more multifaceted and more nuanced than what we could have had alone in our insular internal work teams. Our audience engagement approaches built on and expanded approaches already in use at the museums, 
And here in the top uh, right corner of your screen, which can be shared also after the panel for those interested, are a few resources that will dive a little more deeper than I'm able to do today on, on these approaches in use at the DIA. So for this project, um, we attended an in-community consultation with 30 young Detroit leaders, part of a group called Public Allies. And for the consultation, we were invited to one of their meetings. So we spent an afternoon with them at their home base. Like we left the museum, we left our comfort zone, went to their home base and had small and large group conversations about the exhibitions. Also held four focus groups, which were facilitated by the DIA's evaluation team led by Ken Morris. And two focus groups uh, focused on the rights exhibition and two focused on the DIAs. Of those two, one demographically reflected the DIA's general visitorship and one consisted exclusively of African-American participants. Uh, lastly, we created an advisory panel of nine Detroiters with varying expertise. And it was this group who went on to author the community labels that I worked with. Our conversations with these various folks um, at various points in the exhibition's development show that the exhibitions were resonating with people, but at the same time, they also identified gaps. And those gaps were pretty consistent across all of these conversations, which were that folks expected a more Detroit focus. Hearing that we we're part of this convening, they, they expected a little more of a local concentration. Um, they felt that the Detroit 67 story was not strong enough within this more national um, context that the exhibition was presenting. And we're also looking to hear from more women, more women artists and more women's voices. And so the advisory panel uh, written labels were among uh, the ways that we responded to these calls. They added not only Detroit voices and a stronger Detroit presence, but also a sort of like a personal touch um, because they had this first person reflective writing structure um, that I'll tell you a little bit about how we got to. We met with the panel twice, two months apart for three hours. Um, and as we formed the nine person panel, we intentionally avoided participants whose professional backgrounds would align too closely with our in-house staff. We weren't looking to replicate kind of the expertise that we already had. We were looking to really expand on that. Um, through uh, folks with experience in adjacent and related subject matter. So that included working artists, um, scholars of literature, scholars of urban geography, activists, and a psychologist. Um, some panelists did have some pre-existing relationships with the museum. We had worked with them in, in other types of ways in the past, while others were, um, I don't wanna say cold called, but we, we, you know, we found out about the person and reached out to them without having any kind of prior relationship or prior contact. And the labels were the culmination of our second and final gathering with them. So we simulated a gallery in our meeting room. You see that in the photo, kind of put up pictures of the artwork on the walls and panelists selected the works that they wanted to focus on. We had a reflection activity that was 50 minutes long. Some wrote and submitted their thoughts on the spot while others kind of jotted some stuff down, took them home, refined them and emailed them to us later. For this reflection activity, we intentionally kept the prompt pretty loose and open-ended. And we asked them to consider things like how the work made them feel, what thoughts or emotions it sparked for them, and what they hoped others would consider, notice, pay attention to in the work or think about while viewing it. At the start of the reflection, I made available one page sheets with uh, some bullet points, brief art historical information about the artworks for participants who wanted it or might feel more comfortable starting there. Um, and although most didn't take them, in hindsight, I wish that I hadn't actually even gone there and offered that um, because I think it risked being counterproductive. The strength of the panel was that they had wide ranging expertise that was beyond sort of just traditional art history. Like we, we had that knowledge in house. And so the purpose of the labels being to demonstrate that a range of perspectives can coexist and nuance uh, a work of art or historical event based on individuals' own experiences. So by inserting that kind of typical or standard art historical information as a baseline or a starting point, um, risked inadvertently privileging that type of information, which wasn't sort of what we were trying to get at. Um, and could have also made the writers feel compelled to incorporate it or use that to, to shape their reflections. So kind of in, in hindsight, um, 
I might facilitate it a little bit differently if I were to do it today. The Exhibition development timeline was a year from start to finish, and the final advisory panel meeting that I just talked about was held four months before the exhibition opened. So by that point, um, we, had, we had already talked to them once before. We were probably 75% of the way through the exhibition's design process and had a solid draft of the exhibition label copy, though not yet with the actor. So that kind of, just to kind of give you a sense of where this was falling within our overall uh, development. And so we, um, you know, both pulled in the community written content into an existing draft, and we also reshaped our own copy as needed to help to center those responses. So like I mentioned earlier, we pulled a label that was not as compelling as what they had written. Um, and we were, you know, flexible in making those kinds of adjustments um, as we needed to. For the community written uh, copy, the interpretive team, which included me and former director of interpretive engagement, Sarupa Anila, did a copy edit only just for clarity, accuracy, and readability. So the DIA has institutional guidelines for length and style and voice, but we did not attempt to conform these labels into those standards. Rather, we prioritized maintaining the writer's voice and their style. In one instance where a multi-page response was too long to sort of comfortably fit on the wall and maintain readability and legibility, we worked closely with the writer to excerpt a portion um, in a way that she felt comfortable with and felt true to her work. And then all of the writers approved the final text before printing. We did not formally evaluate the impact of these specific labels on visitor engagement in the exhibition. So we didn't directly ask people what you thought about X label, but as part of the more general visit, a visitor exit survey and that general like overarching exhibit evaluation, um, visitor comments pointed to these labels um, and that suggests that the community authored perspectives strengthened opportunities for visitors to make personal connections and local relevancies, which were the very facets that our earlier conversations had indicated we were missing. During Art of Rebellion's final hours, visitors filled the open courtyard at the heart of the museum that holds Diego Rivera's Detroit industry murals. And there, there was a standing room only multimedia performance of Crossroad, which was created by a new collective of contemporary Detroit artists, spearheaded by two advisory panel members, Sharina Rodriguez Sharp and Chase Morant. Um, and they um, indicated they had been inspired by their work on the exhibition as part of the panel. And that sort of prompted them to uh, form this collective. And in their words, Crossroad aimed to explore how art can hold grief and healing as a form of resistance. Thank you. Pass it over to Samir. Thanks, Melanie. Uh, yeah, we'll come back and kind of dig a little deeper into some of these issues you've raised. Uh, thank you very much. Samir, take it away. Great, thank you, Troy. And yeah, thank you, Troy, for, for hosting. Um, this session and thanks to the to the larger Corning Museum team for for pulling together this really amazing two day seminar. Um, I too am going to share some slides. Um, so let me see if I can uh, go ahead and do that. Um, so what I'll be sharing with you today is a bit about our our museum, um, which has has a unique history as the first, the nation's first federally funded community museum. Um, and then share a bit about a particular exhibition um, and about our exhibition development process for that particular project, um, which hopefully will speak to this notion of, of working in, with, and for communities, because I, I think it is, it's very possible to, to both uh, work in and with communities and not necessarily for communities, and also to work with for communities and not necessarily in and with communities. And so really thinking about what it means to uh, meaningfully uh, work collaboratively with communities, both with and for communities. And so um, I'll share a bit about, again, our, the history of our museum and then uh, this one case study from a recent exhibition. Also to let you know just uh, where we're located geographically, uh, you know, we're one of uh, 19 Smithsonian museums. Uh, we're one of the few located off of the National Mall. Um, and you can see uh, on the left there, the National Mall, where most of the Smithsonian museums are. And on the bottom right where ours is, east of the Anacostia River, which is that body of, of water that, that cuts uh, to, the, to the southeast of Washington, 
um, which has historically been a kind of social, political, and economic border and, and barrier in the city. Um, and, and um, you know, in ways that that continue to play out in the city and the region today, um, and and we're in uh, and were founded in and still are in a historically and majority African American uh, neighborhood. This is actually the first site of our museum in the mid 1960s. The then Secretary of the Smithsonian, Dylan Ripley, was really, and, and for that matter, other Smithsonian staff were reckoning with the fact that the Smithsonian was maybe not meeting its mission of meaningfully documenting, preserving, sharing, and celebrating the the histories and cultures of the many communities that make up the US. And, and for that matter, particularly in the case of Washington DC, which by that, that time was a majority uh, African-American city, DC was in fact the first major US city to have a majority African-American population beginning in the, in the late 1950s, around 1957. Um, but the fact of the matter was that very few African-Americans were visiting the museums on the mall. Um, and it wasn't just a matter of distance from place of residence, but in fact, the the lack of collections, programming, and exhibitions that actually featured African-American history and culture. And so the then secretary of the Smithsonian was had this idea of opening up a, a museum, a Smithsonian museum off of the National Mall in a DC neighborhood that could begin to do that, that more community collaborative work. Uh, the old Carver Theater was selected as the site right there in the heart of our neighborhood called Anacostia. And I would say the really most important decision that ends up being made uh, the, uh, on the Smithsonian's behalf or by the Smithsonian was this uh, selection of our founding director, John Kennard, who, when he was hired in 1966 or early 67, um, as director, had actually had no museum experience whatsoever. But he did have a really rich background as a community organizer, as a pastor, a longtime resident in the neighborhood, um, uh, and, and much else. Um, and he very quickly took this idea um, that the Smithsonian had of kind of sharing its treasures with a quote unquote under-resourced community and actually began to work with the community to document and preserve the community's history. Um, he was the first African-American director of a Smithsonian Museum and our museum ended up developing uh, the first African-American history and culture focused exhibitions and programs of the Smithsonian. Um, so these are just some early images of, of, the, of, this, of the site of our museum, the original site uh, on what's now called Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue. Um, and the museum opened in September of 1967, um, worked with young people who helped prepare the site, um, renovating the building, helping clean up. Um, the museum formed very early on a youth advisory council where young people from the neighborhood could come and, and actually help shape that programs and exhibitions. Uh, the museum even had a, a mobile museum with the idea that uh, for those that weren't nearby, uh, that the, the, the mobile museum could actually bring um, exhibit content and, and, and other resources to, to, to communities beyond. Um, and then finally, I'll just mention quickly one early exhibition um, just two years after the museum opened that I think spoke to the kind of um, ethos and approach of the museum at the time and in many ways I would say still today. Uh, and that was an exhibition that was developed um, in response to some young people who um, were part of the museum's community uh, who were surprised that in the petting zoo that the museum opened when it first opened, um, that there were rodents, um, which they thought were rats, but in fact were just hamsters and, and gerbils. But the reason they thought they were rats is because their neighborhood uh, was experiencing an infestation of rats. And, and so they brought this idea, the young kids did, of, of doing an exhibit about rats because they were deeply interested in just this, you know, this rodent that was infesting their neighborhoods. And so the museum took this very mundane issue a rat infestation and developed an exhibition in collaboration with young people in the neighborhood um, that used that topic as a window onto broader issues of urban ecology, social inequality, you know, everything from uh, the particular species of rat, the Norway rat that infested American cities, but also um, questions around why it was that certain neighborhoods and not others were experiencing rat infestation. So looking at the inequalities in um, public works and public services. Um, and, and that exhibition actually caused quite a stir in the museum world the fact that a museum and a Smithsonian Museum, no less, would broach such an issue as rat infestation. Uh, but it also began to really um, continue the work of reimagining um, the role that museums could play in communities and, for that matter, society uh, more largely. Um, and these are just a couple images of, of that exhibition. Um, and today, our, our mission statement at the museum, which I think speaks to really the ethos and approach of the museum in the early years, is that together with local communities, you know, we illuminate and amplify our collective power. Um, and so this exhibition that I'm gonna be sharing more about, A Right to the City, which 
opened in 2018 and, and was the result of several years of community collaborative work, I think extended that tradition of, of broaching contemporary social issues. And in this case, um, gentrification, um, which Washington DC has been experiencing um, quite rapidly over the past decade and a half, almost two decades now. Um, so just to give you a sense of, of really the behind the scenes and, and how we went about developing the exhibition, um, I'll walk you through some of the different facets um, and steps in the process. Um, one really key part of this exhibition was conducting oral history interviews. So much of Washington DC's history, despite it being the nation's capital, um, has really gone, gone under documented. And so a big part of the work we wanted to do was to create a historical record of of the neighborhoods and the city's histories. Um, and so we went about interviewing longtime residents, organizers, activists, government officials. Um, you know, just one example here, William T. Fontroy Jr. was the first um, African-American civil engineer hired by uh, Washington's um, Transit Authority. Uh, he trained with the Tuskegee Airmen. He was uh, you know, born and raised in Washington, D.C.'s Shaw neighborhood. Um, so he had just really incredible stories to share. Um, and similarly, Art Ping Lee, um, who moved to Washington, D.C. in the 1930s um, as a new immigrant from China, um, uh, you know, has been a longtime community leader uh, in that neighborhood, in particular, Washington, D.C.'s Chinatown. Um, so it's story like, stories like theirs that were really important to be able to, to, to document with them and, and also in ways that helped shape what ended up in the exhibition itself. Uh, but that process of conducting oral histories also was part of the process of, of building meaningful relationships with community members and building a sense of investment on, on their part in the work of the museum and in the exhibition. Another thing that we did was host community forums, citywide community forums, where we invited uh, community members and various kinds of um, experts um, to, to weigh in on issues related to gentrification and neighborhood change. So, uh, you know, uh, there were community forums about the impact of gentrification on the arts scenes in Washington, D.C., um, the impact of gentrification on the public education, uh, public education in Washington, D.C., and then even neighborhood specific uh, community forums like this one about the past and future of, of Washington, D.C.'s Chinatown, um, which is one of the neighborhoods deeply um, transformed by gentrification and, in fact, um, urban renewal uh, over many decades. Um, and so these are just actually some images of the exhibition itself. Um, the exhibition featured six neighborhoods from across Washington, D.C., covering the four quadrants of the city. Um, obviously, Washington, D.C. has many more than six neighborhoods. It has, in fact, more than 120 named neighborhoods. But the idea was really to feature neighborhoods um, that often otherwise go overlooked, but also neighborhoods that had really compelling histories of uh, change and also community organizing and activism. So one other element of, of this that we, we implemented was creating actually a storytelling system, opening up lines of communication. So again, it's not just the museum dictating to the audience what this the important history is, um, but in fact, allowing um, uh, community members and visitors to, to weigh in with their own stories. And so we repurposed a payphone and created a storytelling system where when you pick up picked up the phone, uh, you would hear a menu and you could listen to clips from oral histories that we did or record your own story. Um, and in fact, we were able to then take clips of the stories that people left us and put them on the phone line so others could hear what um, community members had contributed as stories. Um, and on the side of the payphone there, you can also see these small kind of business cards on which we printed the same a phone number that people could call from their own phone and share those business cards with their family members and, and neighbors so they too could call into the the storytelling system um interestingly you know you don't realize but uh, pay phones are, are quite a curiosity especially the young people who had, you know had never saw them never used them and so um for for people of a certain age it, it kind of harkened back to that time when pay phones were um uh, were abundant on street corners, and whereas for young people, really just uh, you know seen as, as a curiosity, um, but again, it kind of served that dual purpose of of, of capturing some meaningful part of of city life um, for those that knew what a payphone was, and and then yeah, sparking the interest and curiosity of young people who didn't know what a, a payphone was. 
Um, and then the other thing that we did was partner with the DC Public Library. Again, the idea really here was democratizing access to, to, the, to the histories and, and sharing back with the communities that we worked with in the documentation of the history. And so um, DC Public Library, um, we worked with them to install these kind of pop-up exhibits in the specific neighborhoods that we had worked with and featured in the exhibition. Um, and the other thing that we did was make the, the storytelling system available in these DC public library locations across the city. Um, so people could call that number and we were actually even able to install these phones um, at the library locations. In this particular location, uh, in the Adams Morgan and Mount Pleasant neighborhoods in Northwest DC, there's a large Latinx population. So we had actually one English language phone line and one Spanish language phone line, again, to just create as much access as possible. And then had these kind of postcards with a map showing the different locations where we had these pop-up exhibits, um, which again, which were, were neighborhood specific. And so the content about, for instance, the Adams Morgan neighborhood was in the neighborhood, the library location that served that neighborhood. Um, and and, um, and on and on throughout the different neighborhoods that we featured. We also were able to have a mobile payphone that we could carry to events that we did. This was a, a public uh, community forum that we held, a panel discussion that we held at a, a local um, uh, bookstore slash restaurant uh, called Busboys and Poets. And, and so we were able to bring the payphone there. And again, mm -hmm. just allowing people to listen to stories and record their own. Um, we also brought the payphone to street festivals um, this was the Adams Morgan Day uh, Festival, which is this Washington, D.C.'s longest running um, neighborhood festival um, where people could, again, listen to and share their stories. And then we collaborated with um, something called the Humanities Truck, which is that red truck in the background based at American University, which is really a kind of um, a, a truck that's been outfitted with um, the space and and uh, equipment to be able to do mobile exhibits. And so on the inside of the truck and on the outside of the truck, we were able to take content from the main exhibit and, and place it there and display it there and have oral histories running on the screens and on the speakers that the truck had. Um, these are just some images of people engaging with the, the, the exhibits uh, on the truck. And then finally, uh, one of the thing that we did um, for the Adams Morgan neighborhood was create this um, using the same platform, um, create a texting system, again, democratizing access, creating more access to the content, trying to bring history to life, um, where people could actually use this postcard, walk around the neighborhood and just text the different numbers of the locations in the neighborhood, and they would actually get back a historic photo um, of that site in the neighborhood, along with some information about it. Um, so again, just another way to bring the history to life, share the history back with the community, um, and find creative ways to engage um, community with, with the content. And the last thing I'll say is just, you know, that, that the exhibition itself, the main exhibition at the museum became a gathering space, you know, for um, nonprofits and community organizing collectives and even city government agencies, you know, um, where they would bring their um, either staffs or, or community members um, and have discussions and tours of the exhibitions and in some cases staff retreats to really have deep discussions around um, the issues that were broached in the exhibition, um, really exploring how and why neighborhoods um, changed and transformed over the course of the, the 20th century, but also how communities came together um, in the face of change or the threat of change to either preserve their neighborhoods or remake them in ways that served their needs and interests. Um, so that really also helped cultivate the museum as a site, a safe space where community members felt welcomed um, and felt like their stories uh, were being heard and celebrated. Uh, and actually, yeah, lastly, so we also did host a, a symposium, a national symposium where we brought together a kind of diverse, um, and by diverse, I mean in terms of actually practice or, or kind of work, um, diverse um, um, community of, of organizers, scholars, policymakers to, you know, really break down the silos that often exist between um, these various kind of communities of scholars um, and organizers and policymakers and, and to have them at the same table to be, have, to, you know, be in dialogue around these important issues about neighborhood change and gentrification and um, really development without displacement. Um, so I'll end there, but um, you know that was a bit about both the history of our museum and, and this one recent case study uh, from this exhibition, A Right to the City, and, and looking forward to, to being in, in conversation with you.
Yeah, I'm excited. I actually will be down there in uh, early November and, and I'm looking forward to seeing the external exhibition that will be on display. So thank you so much for sharing that, both of you. Um, we've got a little bit of time left, so I thought I might kind of dig into some of the, you know, you've go, both given very different views of how a museum can engage uh, different communities, um, which actually speaks to the fact that like something else, you know, we were hearing earlier is that there's no one way to do this. And depending on what your project is, um, you have to be very particular about which path you take. Um, so I'm just curious, you know, in both of your experience, what do you feel like are the features of partnerships that make a project intrinsically valuable, not just to the museum, but also to the community partners you're working with? What are some of the things that kind of create that, you know, productive relationship? And you don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to, to us to go for it. I mean, I'm happy to jump in unless Melanie, you would like to like to go first. Um, so, you know, I, I do think that um, just very found in a foundational sense, you know, that having as much as possible longstanding meaningful relationships with community members, I mean, goes a long way toward just being attuned to kind of the needs and interests um, of a community. And so, you know, I think even in terms of the ideas that emerge about what kinds of exhibitions and programs to, to develop, right, if one is in continual conversation with and dialogue with community, then that could be, you know, take shape in any number of forms and formally or more formally. Um, but being able to just have those lines of communication open with community, um, that ideas emerge from there. Um, in a way that honors and is um, kind of accountable to the community. Um, but then I think, you know, building on that kind of already existing relationship, or if you're having to build those relationships anew, um, then really doing the work of demonstrating a kind of commitment and dedication to um, the interest and needs of, of community and, and not necessarily bringing kind of, um, or centering uh, the institution's um, kind of priorities um, first, you know, um, and so I think opening those lines of communication, building meaningful relationships really lays the foundation for being able to do um, genuinely community collaborative work. Um, and then as much as possible, building in um, accountability throughout the process. And so ensuring that there's community weighing in, not just at the beginning, not just at the end, not just in the middle, but really um, as much as possible scaffolding accountability and check-ins um, throughout the process um and um yeah i don't know those are some of the initial things that that come to mind for me just in terms of just the characteristics of of some of that community collaborative work so in some ways you're saying that having the meaningful relationship before a project even comes along means that the project can potentially be more intrinsically valuable to both the museum and the community that we're working with or engaged with so kind of yeah, allows an openness to a kind of organic quality to the development of projects too. Yeah, and I think, you know, that it becomes also less transactional that way. You know, if, yes. if there's a kind of a sense of investment, um, a sense of commitment that the community has seen over time. But again, I realize if, if you're kind of building this anew, then, then going about trying to build those relationships, cultivate those relationships, making your space, you know, available as much as possible for use by community members for instance, or um, finding ways to really um, have your institution serve the needs of the local community can go a long way towards kind of building um, those lines of communication and the trust. Great. Melanie, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I think only that, you know, in the case of Art of Rebellion, um, you know, the folks we spoke with wanted to see something that felt personal and local reflected in the content. Um, and so, you know, that was something that would have made it more valuable to them was, was something that really resonated on a more personal um, level and personal, not just of their own person, but also their family and friends and the stories that they've heard. Um, and so that sort of was a gap, right, where the museum was kind of headed in one direction and, and folks kind of pushed us to, I mean, we didn't completely, um, 
go in a different direction, but to really reflect on um, opportunities to make it a little more local and a little more personal, especially given the topic. Um, and I guess related to that, you know, I think a lot of times museums kind of make these exhibition schedules um, really far out. I mean, it's a very common practice, um, but that kind of puts museums in a place where we're here's the project we're going to do, let's get people involved versus maybe having a more openness and more flexibility to not kind of pre-plug everything and instead understand what kinds of things people want to see and, and let the ideas be generated from your community connections, not just internally within your own staff. It's interesting to me that, you know, both, you know, with the Anacostia Museum and then just kind of, Melanie, you're talking about kind of the ability to kind of create a space where you're hearing what people in your local community personally want, which is a hard thing to get sometimes when you're a museum that doesn't have those connections. We oftentimes think it's just a matter of, of asking the question, you know, what would you, you know, what would you like to see or what would, you know, resonate with you? But that's not really the way people think a lot of times. And I'm, I'm kind of intrigued by both the payphone idea as sort of this kind of almost like a nexus for communication that's somewhat anonymous, but also very personal at the same time. And, you know, I'm thinking about the focus groups that you were working with and how that emerged you know, something more personal with the personally written labels by a specific group identified. What is the role of, of personal relationship and, and these spaces that may not immediately feel welcoming to some of the people that we're interested in, in seeing and having be a part of the content in our museums? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm glad to to weigh in first on this again, Melanie. I'd like to to um, you know, I think um, hopefully this goes some way towards answering that question. But I, you know, I think about you know, like I, I'm I'm trained as a historian and curator, and um, you know, there are very traditional kinds of ways of going about the work um, or expectations about how one goes about the work. And I I think that um, you know, one thing that I see is just really important to the work that I do at a community museum is is being present in spaces beyond the museum and so really trying to 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 be you know present at whether it's community meetings or um uh, community events right so that uh you're a known entity um and again that's for me I mean I often I rarely think about this explicitly um and as in, as a as a kind of practice but I, I do think that and, and upon reflection, that's really kind of what it is. And part of what I think helps cultivate meaningful relationships is being present in a community again. So it's not just, you know, I'm representative of a museum, will you work with us? Um, but actually being out and in, in, in and around community. Um, um, so you're not just popping in and out for whatever your purposes are, um, but have some presence beyond that. Um, uh, and, and so, you know, again, I think that that one allows you to be attuned to, to what's going on in the, in the community and um, again, what the needs and interests are, but then also I think opens up more easily lines of communication um, with community members. Um, so I think what, yeah, one being out in the community oneself, even if it's not traditionally thought of as like part of your quote unquote duties um, um, as a museum staff member, but then also finding ways to open up the institution to the community you know, if there are spaces that you can rent out, but in, are able to maybe offer, um, you know, gratis to, to community organizations to use, I'm um, really just helping build uh, this idea that the, the, the museum isn't just this walled off space that's only for displaying um, exhibitions, but in fact can be used in one form or another for community. And it doesn't have to be space, it can be, you know, any kind of resource that the museum has that can be made available to community. Um, in one form or another, I think, again, just helps um, cultivate this idea of the museum as a community friendly space, again, so that it's not so transactional that when you're inviting someone to participate just in an exhibit, that's the only time that they're coming. Um, so I don't know, those are a couple of, of ways in, 
that come to mind of of helping open up those lines of communication with with those are kind of two hard things for a lot of museums to disrupt you know one is thinking of a typically gen revenue generating space as being something that can be for the community but then also stepping outside of the museum and our kind of grind of museum activity into the community just to spend and hold space with with our community is a real shift for a lot of the ways a lot of us think. Um, I have a question, a couple of questions actually. The first uh, is for Melanie. Um, uh, Martha says that thinking of the powerful words Melanie said about how art can hold grief and healing, is there more that can be said about that? It reminds me of, uh, reminds her of the earlier talk about funerary glass objects in Roman times. Um, hmm, I don't, I'm not sure I can, how to answer that. Um, I didn't see the earlier panel. Um, and that was sort of the, the words of our, our panelists who put together that, that performance. Um, I, I guess I'm not sure if this will answer your question, but I guess what I'll say, um, is that, um, that, that idea of, of, the uh, exhibitions as um, a way toward healing or toward some reparative work, um, you know, is, is is a tough thing to get at. We did find that um, some of this, you know, did provide a little bit of a I don't want to say catharsis for folks in in the room, but we did find that there were really strong emotional reactions to to the art and to the content. Um, this is sort of minor, but we actually found that some of our security officers um, were bringing in tissues um, personally that they had purchased on their own um, and brought into the exhibition because they had so many visitors who were in need of them, um, which led us to, once we found that out, um, put out, uh, you know, boxes of Kleenex and try to make some more seating spaces for people to really contemplate in that way. And it's not that we didn't expect that people would have an emotional reaction to the content or that that's, you know, would it would be a, a point of catharsis. But at the same time, I'm not sure we we designed for that in the way that we that we could have. Um, and so, again, I don't know if this is quite answering the question that's asked in the way that the asker was hoping for, but um, you know, there can be those kind of unexpected um, ways that people connect and respond that are maybe more unexpected or deeper or in a different way than we expected. And for the, the artists who uh, went on to, to do the performance at the end, I mean, it was really this, at the start of the exhibition, we could have not imagined that this would be almost like the punctuation mark on the end of the, of the exhibit in terms of like its physical presence in the museum and just the amount of people in the room and kind of seeing that that exhibition um, come to life in a particular way. Um, again, it, it required an amount of, um, you know, openness and flexibility on the part of the museum to have this, like, this wasn't a pre-scheduled program, but we're gonna do it and we're gonna fit it in. And, and that was really championed within our, our division. So um, yeah, I guess I'll stop there, but um, I, I guess to the point of like, what, how to foster that within you know your spaces is really just about allowing a certain amount of humility and vulnerability and flexibility on the part of your own internal work processes to to make sure that you're not trying to be so um, rigid or polished in terms of your processes or your schedules that you're actually like stifling those possibilities as they emerge. Yeah, we see, I mean, we, we make space for the idea that art and human expression are these sort of locales for emotions that visitors bring. And then, but then when it happens actually in the galleries and all of a sudden <laughs> you're sort of, whoa, I didn't expect this, you know, what does that say about us, you know, the way we think about our work, you know? And, but I feel like just from the example you were talking about is that, no, I mean, part of what we as museum interpreters who, Sort of have to kind of navigate this journey for the museum and kind of kind of serve as a as a hopefully a bond or you know uh, a helpful guide is that we won't we have to admit to ourselves we don't know what's going to happen you know i mean i think that's a that's a really positive thing that people 
could see themselves enough that they had some personal empathy with that situation. And then eventually that the museum came along and said, you know, we're not done here. You know, we've got some work to do with these people who are having this experience. And this is another opportunity for us to kind of grow with them, you know. So it is, we do have to give up a certain amount of, of awareness of what we're going to see happen, yeah. you know, and just maybe do some thinking about what we hope to see happen and then just be ready to, like you said, pivot. Um, and, and, you know, getting back to that sort of small tissue example, um, you know, as a practitioner, right, I had done all this work in the build leading up to the exhibit, and then it was open. And it's not that I never stepped foot in it again, because of course I did. But we're so operational in museums. I was already on to the next project, right? And so this, I had this sort of um, process of shaping a visitor experience, and yes, talking with community members, but then 40,000 people came to the exhibition. And I didn't interact with those 40,000 people. That security officer did. And there's a type of presence that you know, he, he was able to see that I could not see because of you know, my then disconnectedness from the project. And so you know, thinking about it as not just as, as you know, we all kind of need each other and to kind of also reflect on like, when do we also get caught up in like the administrative stuff and the schedule and the next thing and kind of start to inadvertently distance ourselves from that good work that we did in the process that like I didn't even think to do something like that I didn't even know yeah there's uh so much actually that this conversation has put to in motion in my mind that I'd love to have another hour just to kind of continue that um I I Samir I want to hear your last words and then I also have a specific question for you which is when the kids were on the fake payphone uh would they pretend to call people or would they prank people? How, you know, what did you notice a difference in behavior between the kids and the people who actually knew what a payphone was? Yeah, so they um so the way that the phone worked was when you pick it up, it actually automatically rings and and brings you to to the to this storytelling system menu. Um so you couldn't prank call anybody or, but um you know uh there were a few young people that left stories. Um, they tended not to be, well, yeah, not that young of, you know, like seven or eight, but but older. Um, so, you know, they weren't, yeah, but the phone system allowed, they were curious to hear what people were saying on the phone. And so they would often just, you know, press through the menu to hear the different stories, the clips of oral histories that we had on there. Great, great. Um, and then, uh, I've got a request. Did, 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 did the YouTube the crossroad performance, Melanie? That's a good question. I don't know, but I can try to find out. Yeah, and I can kind of pass that on as needed. Uh, we we are will put present proceedings from this as well, so we can also include it if it's there in that. So. I am so grateful for both of you uh, being willing to spend time with us today and talk about this. What feels to me like for us is a very uh, emergent journey that we're on and excited about it, but you know, with a lot of unanswered questions that we are ourselves having to figure out as we go, which is the only way really to do this work. So um, thank you for helping us along that journey and uh, for being a part of seminar this year. I'm gonna close it down and well, I think we're taking a break in the next 30 minutes. So if you wanna to go to one of the community rooms, you can. And then we'll regather at uh, three o'clock uh, for our last session of the day, which is displaying Haudenosaunee beadwork in museums. So again, thank you very much. We'll see you later. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having us. Bye-bye.